Okay. All right, so I think this is as good a time as any to to have make a start. Uh, we've only got one speaker today. Normally on uh, in these cafe research events, we have two speakers lined up, but unfortunately the other speaker had to pull out. Um, so the one speaker we have today is PhD student Dan Powell from the School of Arts in the Department of English. And Dan is a final um, year research student uh, funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the Midlands Three Cities uh, Doctoral Training Partnership. Uh, Dan's research um, title for his, his thesis is Shaping Storiness, Developing a Pre-Closural Approach to Writing Short Fiction. And so take it away, Dan. Oh yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, as, as I said, that um, I'm a doctoral researcher in creative writing, actually, in the, in the School of Arts. So um, my thesis and my research has been a, cri a critical a, a kind of a, a research led um, creative uh, thesis. So it, the res end result of it has been the production of a collection of short fiction in response to uh, a particular area of reader response theory, which is pre-closure theory. So I'm going to take you through the basics of kind of pre-closure theory and what that means for me as a writer, what that has meant in terms of changing my writing process as a writer. Um, prior to taking on this research, um, I've been writing short stories for about six, seven years at the time when I, when I came across pre-closure theory. Um, as an area of research. And at that time, I just published my first collection of short fiction. And the short story is very much my preferred form for writing in. Um, for me, there's something compelling about the short story form, something about the density of its language, about how the imminence and imminence of the ending within each story combines and generates an intensity that is much greater than the size of the short story. Um, the short story is at once a glimpse and a moment. Um, it's uh, into it is a glimpse into a moment, into a whole life, and it's impactful because of its brevity rather than despite it. There's something about the short story that enables it to pack a great deal into a very very small space, and done well, the short story punches the reader in the heart, makes them really feel something. It's an experience that you go through. Um, and two thousand in two thousand and sixteen, while I was reading new short story the theories edited by Charles E. May, I stumbled across Susan Lohafer's work on pre-closure in the short story. I was thrilled to discover Lohafer's attempts to describe the experience of quote entering, moving through, and exiting from story end quote. Um, this presented something of the mechanism by which the short story delivers the depth of experience that it does in such a brief space. Um, this idea of the experience of entering, moving through and exiting from story is what Susan Lohafer calls storiness. Um, Lohafer defines pre-closure then. She defines pre-closure as those points in a narrative where readers feel the story could end. So it's very much a reader response theory. Um, and the pre-closure sentences in a short story frame a series of putative stories that lead up to the actual story, which is the text as it's finally printed. And Lohefer's work reveals how pre-closure and putative stories within the short form structure the reading experience, impact upon the reader, and help to generate a depth of meaning within the short story that far outstrips its size. In her individual reader study of the American short story, Lohefer undertook a preclosural analysis of 45 American short stories from three separate periods in the development of the form. So she read 45 stories and identified the preclosure sentences within them, and she then analysed those preclosure sentences, focusing her attention on three closural sentences found within all three within all short stories. And the and Lohefer selected closural sentences were the anterior closure sentence, which is the preclosure point nearest the beginning of the story. The penultimate closure sentence, which is the pre-closure point closest to the end of the story, and then the actual closure moment, the actual last sentence or final closure of the story. And Lohafer's analysis of the, um, the 45 stories that she looked at revealed um, the peculiar and characteristic closural structure present within the American short form in specific periods. She also identified the dominant closural signals that were used during specific periods of the American short stories development. 
And after reading her American study, I saw pre-closure everywhere in the stories that I was reading. I even found pre-closure at work within my own stories, which was a particular surprise. Prior to reading Lohafer's research, I hadn't consciously considered pre-closure during the writing of my own stories. I wasn't even aware of it as a theory. Um, but by staging a pre-closure within my stories showed that there was clearly an unconscious process that was going on within my writing, one that I'd internalised through years of reading and then writing short stories. My exposure to pre-closure theory and my own unconscious use of pre-closure in my writing got me thinking. I wondered whether data from a pre-closure study of short stories could be used to consciously inform and direct the writing process. So in a sense, to turn the reading theory into a writing theory. Um, and this question led me to my current research into the development of a pre-closure writing methodology. So there are two strands to my research-led creative project. The first strand is a pre-closure analysis of 60 short stories. And this pre-closure study is designed to uncover the closure signal usage specific to the British short story between 1800 and 2015. And the second strand uses the data from my study to generate pre-closure writing frames designed to direct the writing of new short fiction. So in my pre-closure analysis, I focus my attention on four specific periods in the development of the British short story. And I examined 15 stories written and published within each period, which gave me a total of 60 stories um, to, to look at in terms of pre-closure. And I identified the various global and local closure signals at work within each of the individual anterior, penultimate and final closure sentences in each of the stories. And the resulting data then informed my design of pre-closure writing frames. So my pre-closure writing frame transforms the data that I gathered during the pre-closure analysis into a writing tool. Its existence is as a set of instructions embodies my proposed shift from an unconscious process of stage and closure during the writing of the short story towards a new, more conscious approach. When developing the writing frames, I identified various closure signals that show the highest and lowest levels of incidence within each of my four sample periods. I then populated the writing frames according to the closure signal trends identified in the data from my pre-closure analysis. I produced two frames for each period. My primary frame for each period reflects the prevalent trends of closure signal use within the period while my secondary frame inverts the primary frame and features those closure signals most infrequently used in each given period. And each frame gives specific guidance on the narrative features the story must exhibit, exactly which closure signals should be employed, when to employ them and in what quantities. So each frame was a strict set of instructions that I had to follow when writing each story. Um, and that, that, those instructions were taken directly from the data. Um, for each period data set, as you'll see from this table, I wrote one story using each period's primary prevalent trend frame and one story using the secondary emerging declining trend frame. And then I also wrote one story without any frame at all. So after after dealing with the data within each period, I then wrote one story um, that was completely free from any kind of directional writing frame. These final freestyle stories within each period group were intended as a kind of control experiment and designed to examine whether the prior use of the pre-closure writing frames influenced my subsequent unguided writing in any way. So what effect did the frame have upon my writing process and the stories that I produced? Well, in terms of the writing process, during the writing of the initial stories, the pre-closure frames felt very restrictive. It was very difficult to write with them at the beginning. Um, trying to draft closure sentences that employed all the required closure signals um, was very problematic. So trying to deal with all of the data, all of the um, the closure signals that I was being directed to use at, um, at all at once, that was um, very problematic, very difficult to do. To alleviate this issue, I amended the process slightly so that during the first stage of writing, I focused only on the global whole text closure signals, the structural closure signals. And then in subsequent redrafting of the stories, I focused on the local sentence and word level closure signals. And this made the, the process a lot more manageable um, because I could take it in stages and amend the story. And it felt um, a kind of truer creative experience in terms of, of that kind of process of continually redrafting. And in later drafted, drafting stages, I even amended the process further. Rather than sticking inflexibly to the writing frames, I decided that placing local closure signals within clusters of sentences instead of single sentences proved more practical and creative. 
There are also many benefits to using the pre-closure writing frame. The enforced framework of putative stories that I had to follow meant that I kept my authorial focus on the development of closural staging within the story at all stages within the story. The resulting putative stories give the short story a polyphonic quality as the story shifts tone and genre with each pre-closural sentence. Each putative story shifts in mood and tone. And the use of the frame also helped ensure that the ending of each story landed properly. The closural staging of the story led inexorably towards an ending that felt both surprising and inevitable in pretty much all cases of the when I was writing. Um, and the impact on the stories themselves, I feel, was positive. All of the above made the stories more robust structurally. Usually when I was when I'm writing a story and certainly prior to engaging in this research, I made a lot of structural amendments to stories during redrafting. And I had to do that far less um, when I was engaging in this research than was typical of me. Um, so this is that I feel that, that in some way this process has helped me to was helped me to better structure the stories from an initial point of view, from an uh, from a first from right from the first draft stage. Also, the direction to sentence level redrafting was really helpful in shaping key sections for impact during the final edits. And I had at least partially expected the frames to hinder and benefit the creative work in these ways when I was planning the study. But there was, however, one significant and unexpected side effect of the method. Um, the collection of stories that I ended up writing is dominated by the uncanny. In terms of the content, themes and narrative structure, all 12 of the, 12 of the stories written during this research end up being intensely uncanny. Um, this was not planned. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The early stories were initially intended to be realist tales and they shifted into the mode of the uncanny during the writing of their first drafts. And this happened with each story. I'd start with an idea of a realistic setting and a realistic story. And partway through the drafting process, this uncanny element would emerge. And as this table shows, the three uncanny tropes that appear repeatedly across 12 stories that dominate the collection as a whole. So the three tropes that feature most predominantly were the ghost or the ghostly double temporal anomalies and what Freud described as the acme of the uncanny death. So ghostly doubles haunt the stories in a variety of guises. There's literal ghostly doubles of deceased characters that haunt some of the stories. In others, haunting figures from past and future times become superimposed upon the present. And one character is even visited by his own ghost, which travels back from some future moment of his own death that is still yet to happen. There are also various temporal anomalies manifest within the stories. Time speeds up and slows down or is otherwise fragmented within many of them. This focus on distortions in time is reflected in the structure of many of the stories too, with some of them being told in reverse chronology, while others feature radical time jumps between periods. And death is also a, predominant, a dominant force within the collection, both explicitly in the deaths of characters and also implicitly in the deaths of relationships or environments featured in many of the stories. And the concept of posthumousness also plays out within many of the stories, with deceased characters returning or reappearing. Most notably, the last two stories I wrote, The Mobius Band and The Living Child, seem to double down on this theme and follow the first person narrators beyond the moment of their deaths and into the afterlife. So why should all the stories end up in this collection to be uncanny when I'm using this methodology? Well, to a certain extent, all narrative is uncanny. Characters have secrets, pasts, even an unconscious. Characters are haunted by that past and some are even doomed to repeat it. Um, and these are all features of the uncanny that Freud, Freud described in his famous essay. All narrative, of course, drives towards an ending, um, drives towards a, the death of the text. And all narrative is driven by repetition, whether that's the repetition of the tension between anticipation and retrospection, or the repetition of the tension between differences and resemblance at key points in the text. And the brevity and compression of the short story form serves to emphasise and exaggerate these uncanny features of the narrative. So there's something about the, the concise nature of the, short, of the short story form. It kind of condenses down these elements um, and creates a density of the uncanny within it. It's this brevity and compression of the narrative in the short story that makes short fiction the most end focused of narrative forms. And as such, the short story is also the most death focused. And if, as Freud asserts, death is, quote, the acme of the uncanny, end quote, then the short story is the acme literary form of the uncanny. Freud's concept of the return of the repressed is key to the uncanny, and Freud explains 
that, quote, everything is uncanny that ought to have remained hidden and secret and yet comes to light, end quote. The short story, like the uncanny, is always about something that was hidden being brought into the light of the narrative. And Freud's assertion of the dominance of a compulsion to repeat in the unconscious mind as central to the uncanny can also be seen at work in the short story form. My own pre-closure analysis that provided the foundation for this creative work revealed that repetition and circularity are central to narrative progression in the short story form and the generation of closure within it. In the short story, each pre-closure moment, each putative story simultaneously delays and brings us closer to an ending that is always imminent and immanent in the text. In this way, the short story is at every point along its narrative, both ending and not ending at the same time. The short story then is an intensely uncanny form as a result of the uncertainty of its relationship with its ending. And this relationship is further complicated by what lies outside the text. Michael Trussler proposes that short stories in general, quote, either implicitly or specifically project a hypothetical continuation of the narrative world created by the text, end quote. This is what Trussler calls a post-narrational existence. Walter Benjamin also asserts that, quote, there is no story for which the question as to how it could be continued would be legitimate, end quote. Yet in their focus upon the post-narrational space beyond the end of the short story, both Trussler and Benjamin ignore the space that lies before the beginning of the story. If the short story as a form relies upon a post-narrational projection at its ending, and I would agree that it does, then it must also rely upon a pre-narrational projection that sweeps back from its opening line. The short story presents a, grim a glimpse into life, true, but it must also suggest something of the whole life that exists at either end of the text. And this view is supported by writers in the form. When Raymond Carver proclaims get in, get out, don't linger, and when Kurt Vonnegut advises writers of short stories to start as close to the end as possible, they're essentially supporting Chekhov's view of the short story as all middle. In a sense, then, the short story is all pre-closure. In the pre-narrational pre projection that precedes the text, in the text itself, and in the post-narrational projection beyond the end of the text, ending is always simultaneously happening and not happening. And it is this uncertainty of ending, perhaps more than anything else, that makes the short story an uncanny form. And this uncertainty of the ending also makes the short story an entirely pre-closure or literary form. But in addition to the short story itself being uncanny, I'd also argue that the pre-closure or writing process that I developed is an uncanny methodology. It promotes the presentation of the uncanny. Ron Carson describes the act of writing a short story as, quote, a process involving radical substance changing discovery, end quote. Both the uncanny and psychoanalysis could equally be described in the same terms. Writing itself is an uncanny process. The revealing of that which is hidden in the story takes place in the act of writing. So for myself as a writer, I literally uncover the story as I write it. So the hidden elements of the story emerge um, as I take part in the act of writing. And writing requires an internal doubling of the author self um, into a writer, from writer into reader and from reader into editor. And then there's the fixation upon the end, the death of the text that is paramount within the short story and within writing itself. There's also the unconscious quality of the writing process to consider. It's uncanny that as writers we are often unclear about the agency behind certain choices we make. The writer is somehow also absent in the text. The author is an agent whose purposes are unknown and this absence in turn makes the text itself an uncanny landscape. Finally, any text requires an external double of the writer to fully realise the text the double that is the reader himself or herself. Pre-closure analysis is also an uncanny methodology. So as well as writing being uncanny, pre-closure pre theory and pre-closure analysis is itself actually uncanny. It focuses upon the death of the text that is the end, and it focuses upon repetition within the text. The presence of pre-closure points also raise questions of agency. Is the writer the agent behind the placement of pre-closure sentences? Or is it the reader selecting the pre-closural sentences that is behind the placement of them? Or perhaps there's something about the short story itself that guides the placement of those pre-closural sentences and moments. <laughs>
It's clear, though, that within the short story, each pre-closure moment, each positive story is the symptom of narrative's compulsion to repeatedly end. Each pre-closure moment simultaneously delays and brings closer an ending that is always imminent and imminent in the text, an ending that is always and at once happening and not happening. So as with the uncanny, pre-closure is all about death and uncertainty. My pre-closure analysis of the sample stories and my shaping and the shape and my shaping of the stories using the data from this analysis appears at least in part to have directed me to craft this un intensely uncanny collection of stories. So what in the end have I learned as a writer from my attempt to develop and employ this pre-closure or writing process? Well, firstly, the process has revealed the short story is an intensely uncanny narrative form, densely packed with endings, repetition and the return of the repressed. Engagement with this process has also shown me that the end in a short story is like a black hole into which everything is heading. The gravity of the ending shapes everything within the story that comes before it. And once the ending arrives, that gravity also affects the post narrational projection that lies beyond the event horizon of the story's final closure sentence. Most importantly, though, my experiment in pre-closure has shown that it's possible, even beneficial, to use pre-closure data to direct the writing of new short stories. My use of this pre-closure writing method resulted in the application, amplification, sorry, and exaggeration of the uncanny nature of short fiction within my finished stories. And in completing this research, I discovered that my own sense of storiness is itself deeply uncanny in nature. It's fitting then here at the end of this research that my creative investigations into the short story form, pre-closure and my own writing process should repeatedly and compulsively return to that which is always hidden in the dark corners of the short story, the uncanny. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. That was f fascinating. And, and uh, I, I, I really like that description of sort of the the final ending of the short story being like a black hole that just takes everything that's come before it and shoots it out beyond the event horizon of the, the short story. Um, I'm going to take sort of the chair's prerogative to ask the, the first question. And I'll ask um, yeah. uh, Pete just to sort out the um, uh, the microphone so that this way others can ask questions if they uh, if you'd like. Yeah. Bear with me two seconds and I will um, endeavor to do that. Great. So uh, my my question then is just um, so in your um, in your analysis um, and, and uh, it was it was a left her or left. I, I low hafer low hafer. There he is right in front of me as well. <laughs> uh, low hafer um, uh, perhaps gave you a framework to work from in terms of identifying these uh, pre closural um, frames, um, but when you were um, uh, when you were doing an analysis of British short stories, um, uh, how, how what kind of was distinct about that? How did you find those those frames or identify them? What were you, what were those kind of signs or, or things that you're looking for? Yeah, um, I I mean I took the basics from Lohafer's um, study. But I also, because I knew I was going to be writing short fiction, I extended um, the signals that I was looking for quite a bit. So um, when I was devising the analysis part of the of the research, um, I made sure to um, I accessed a lot of um, sort of stylistic textbooks and identified um, linguistic and structural features within text that I felt would, you know, that felt like they would be have some impact on the, the, our sense of closure. Um, perhaps most obvious sort of sorts of signals that I was looking for. So on a, on a structural level, I was looking at things like how the story used circularity, how it came, because a lot of short fiction kind of turns back on itself or re revisits a moment at, towards its end. Um, but I also looked at things like, um, in terms of structure, um, the presentation of characters. So how, uh, whether a, a character shifts in position in, in relation to the society that it's the character is operating within, for example. So I looked at a lot of structural signals and a lot of um, linguistic signals. So things like, um, a really obvious one would be the, the, the Lohafer identifies is the signal of cl uh, the closural word. So it's words that are literally closural in terms of words like end, final, um, never, uh, so words like that, but then I would also I also pulled in lots of things like negative absolutes. Um, so words like totally, um, yeah, all, for example. So the, the, these words um, that 
they create a sense of completeness or of something, uh, uh, or they tie in with a sense of something ending. And the list got quite um, quite huge at one point. I had to kind of scale it down. And one thing that the, the, the research showed me and that I'll cover in the thesis is the fact that some of the signals that I was looking for didn't appear across any of the periods. So it, it's, it was quite useful in terms of just identifying, okay, so these are clearly closure signals that writers are using. Um, and these other ones that you would think maybe that they might use, they aren't being used for some reason. So they're, perhaps they're not as closural as, as I assumed, or they're not as, um, they're just not, they're, they're not as powerful or as effective as certain other signals. Lost the mic there. No, thanks for that. So the, the um, yeah, it, it, it must have been uh, quite a quite a bit to build that framework, but also to port that from um, from Lohefer and, and kind of apply it to um, uh, a British short story format as well. Did, was there anything that you recognized in the difference between the um, American and British short stories? I, I, you were looking over a huge period of time, so I imagine there's huge changes from the early 19th to the latter 20 or the early 21st century. So yeah, was there any I, differences there? Um, I noted definitely there were differences, certainly in period, there were greater differences than I found perhaps between the American and the British short story, because there are, uh, you know, kind of the, um, the literary, particularly the short story kind of, um, it, it, that's kind of, in terms of how, how it's been, how it's developed, it's kind of had shifts where it's been predominantly in American form and then it's, and then the, the British form has kind of evolved and um, so it, that's kind of gone back and forth, but certainly in terms of period, um, there's been significant changes. One thing, one really interesting thing that I found was that certain trends seem to work in cycles so that you would get signals that would appear at particular stages. So in those three um, closural sentences that I focused on, the anterior, the penultimate and, and the final closure sentences, you would find that signals in one period would appear in the anterior closure and then that signal would then be predominant in the next period would actually be predominant in the penultimate closure moment. So you get this cycling through. And I think it's to do with the fact that the short story was changing in terms of its relationship with, with ending. So endings were far more definite in the 1800, early 1800s. And as we move towards a more open ending within the short story and the epiphany ending in Joyce in, um, um, in Dublin as particularly the impact that that had, you see this, the, the opening of ending starts to push a lot of the closure, the pre-closure moments get pushed further and further back in the story to oh, later. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Sorry, um, Jin, can you unmute? There we go. Thank you. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> Finally, the, the, the pre-closure moments kind of fill up um, the, the, the more pre-closure pre focused signals fill up the early parts of the story and all of the the the, the signals that you would expect to kind of um, formally finish a story and, and and more more kind of completely finish a story they 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 kind of vanish and are pushed presumably pushed out into that um, post narrational projection so the reader has to kind of assemble the final closure for themselves almost in that in that moment and that happens more and more as the short story period develops the short story develops as it, uh, over the different periods now it's fascinating it's it's fascinating just that to you know the the short story as a genre as well and how much it's developed and and, and kind of but always seems to have sort of relied on this element of pre closure um just in so many different ways um i, I would like to pass this over to anyone else to, to ask questions. I think there's a, a very quick question that's been put in the chat from uh, from Jenny Hunt uh, around just asking how long your short stories are. Um, that's that um, they've, they've actually ended up being quite um, quite different in terms of length. Um, some of that was consciously because I um, I very definitely wanted to write um, to see to see how well the pre-closure theory kind of stood up at different lengths of the short story because uh, if you ask any writer how long how long a short story should be um, uh, or any uh, any reader they, there's a, a huge disparity of length anyway and certainly in the study stories that I use for my initial analysis 
there were stories in there that kind of bordered on the novella that were you know huge kind of henry james for example wrote um there's a story in there the beast in the jungle which is that's an it's essentially a novella it's a very long short story so i wanted to write something sort of to that length to um to kind of match writers like henry james and conrad in terms of length for their short stories but then i also wanted to see if you could do the same thing you could use this the the, the pre-closure methodology to write very short stories as well so within my collection um the shortest story i think is about uh, 1900 words about 1900 words the longest story is 15000 words so it's a the, the longest story is a story called fugue which is very much a novella kind of length story it's kind of it's stretching towards that that kind of length um so yeah i've tried to try to create a variety of of lengths within the stories mostly to see how well the pre-closure theory and the pre the, my writing methodology kind of how they how well they tackle those things and i found it a very flexible um process a very flexible methodology that it um it seems to cope no matter what and I, I do know and when I teach I actually um, use a couple of flash fictions that um, that show pre-closure at work in like 300 words so you have all these pre-closure moments within the story and the story's only you know kind of a page long um, so yeah it, it kind of operates at all sorts of levels there's there's almost an, an elasticity to it so that that if the length of the text stretches out the spaces between the pre-closure moments extends it kind of concertinas almost so depending on how how much you squeeze the story in size the spaces between pre-closure moments just shrinks down but it's very adaptable um yeah uh, so jenny says thank you for that uh, i i see that you've you know it, it's good to hear that you kind of explored all all lengths and also shown that it, you know it even works within 300 words that's that's impressive i guess it's it's sort of something that the uh, it's a reward to the reader to to get to those kind of points as well so you're reading for those it's you're not necessarily just reading for the descriptive bits or the the the, yeah. the, the conversations it's you, you want to see the twists and the turns and yeah, yeah very much that's the that. joy of the reading yeah yeah it's a kind of tension and release uh, um, mechanism within the story as well yeah and it's very much about that it's those moments, uh, yeah, where the, the the tension kind of slacken. You know, you have the pre-closure moment, and then the tension slackens for a moment to give the reader a short break. So it does have, yeah, it has quite um, practical um, kind of use uh, elements to its use as well. Yeah. And we've got another question here from uh, Lola. Does anybody want to qu uh, ask a question? Uh, turn on their mic, ask a question that way. Um, by all means, you can. I think you can raise your hand using that, or you just uh, unmute and start to ask your question. No? Okay, well, I'll, I'll um, read out uh, Lola's question. So the, the stories you've written without any frame have the same effect in preclosural moments. Um, that's a really interesting question. The the One of the things that got me started writing um, uh, these stories in this way, getting interested in this research, was the fact that Immediately after reading Lohafer's um, research, I started writing a story. Um, and what I found when I finished writing that story, that I'd written a story that was almost entirely composed of pre-closure sentences. It was almost as though in reaction, and I, I didn't consciously set out to do that. It's just that I, I started writing and the story kind of emerged slowly in that way. And when I, it was only when I finished it that I sudden, suddenly looked back at it and realised, well, blimey, at least half, if not 75% of that story is pre-closure pre moments. It's this really dense story and they kind of, these these pre-closure moments almost kind of unfurl um, like a series of kind of little hidden rooms within the story that just keep opening outwards. Um, so when I, that, that was kind of the reason why I put those stories in to the methodology that I wanted to write those stories without a frame to see what happened during the process. Um, and what I found with th those stories is that um, they, they almost seemed like um, in, in, in the early ones, in the earliest ones. So if I, um, if maybe if I go back on the slide. Um, yeah, so looking at the frames in terms of the, the exterior train station platform night that story ended up being almost um just one moment it's kind of it's it's not quite stream of consciousness but it but it it, it almost stretches out this one single moment so it's a, it's narrated by um a woman who is sitting on a train station platform 
And by the end of the story, the story just kind of freezes. There's 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 this moment where her perception of time is kind of stretching out. So instead of presenting a whole series of pre-closure moments, I, I, I ended up writing a story that ended up being just one long pre-closure moment that doesn't end. Um, and then in The Ghost Boy, that was written without a frame, that story ended up com being written in reverse. For some reason, um, as I started writing the story, I realised that the scenes were unfolding in reverse. So it opens with the ending of the story. And for some reason, I ended up writing the story backwards and it finishes with the beginning moment, which has a revelation in it that shows you where all of the prior events have, have occurred um, and kind of happened from. Um, and in Not the Fall, that story, um, <laughs> again, it kind of plays around with structure and time. So it, in that one, time kind of accelerates by the end of the story. Um, and you end up with this moment where the, the 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 character is both accelerating towards the end and being suspended in his in the in that end moment as well, um, which again wasn't a conscious decision. It's just how, kind of how the story kind of played out. And the last story, the living child, um, it very definitely kind of that story went beyond the ending. So the pre-closure moments and the actual ending of the story happens in the middle of the story. And then I go past it and I almost write the pre-closure, the, the post-narrational projection. So in that story, I kind of broke away from pre-closure entirely and kind of uh, sort of burst the bounds of the story and presented the ending in a way that uh, in the presented the ending in the middle and then continued the story into the character's kind of past life. Um, uh, sorry, po uh, post-death into his post-death kind of experience into his into his next life. Um, so, yeah, it, it, I, those stories all ended up very much kind of playing around with the idea of pre-closure and particularly playing around with the temporal structure of the stories, perhaps. Um, but then other stories did that as well within their framework. So um, I think a story like the um, the Mobius band has two narrators um, and they move in opposite directions. So the first narrator is moving in a chronological direction. And only as you start to read the story, you realise that the other, the second narrator is moving in reverse time. So you're seeing the story being told from two different points in time. And one is move, one of the characters is moving back in time and one of the characters is moving forward in time. And it's only in the middle that they kind of actually meet. So all of these things started kind of happening within the stories. But the these kind of um, breaks with pre-closure, these kind of um, almost kind of subversions or twistings of it or the, the ways that I was kind of playing around with it got more and more intense as the collection kind of developed the stories at the beginning of the of the process so stories like the other woman and what used to be human are much more um, they follow a much more kind of classic progression in terms of narrative time and and the presentation of story and it, but as the process kind of went on yeah I did feel a kind of um, it got more extreme and more accelerated in terms of how I was playing around with the idea of pre-closure and the very structure of pre-closure within the stories. Oh, really interesting and I, I, I think uh, you, you said as well that um, uh, that re recognizing the, the, the or using pre-closure theory uh, improved your efficiency as well in writing so um, from the sort of initial draft, you you were aware of it. You knew kind of the the most pivotal points within the story, and were able to um, to work with that in a more in terms of writing more efficiently as well. Yeah, it was um it was strange that because prior to taking on this research, I did struggle quite a lot in the early stages of my writing with structure. So I do I'd have to do all kinds of strange things depending on the story. Each story would feel like a a little puzzle that I had to figure out. And some stories I had to kind of I wrote them and then I had to cut them up and rearrange things. And um, other story, one story I remember um, I struggled with so much that I ended up writing each of this kind of stories beats on big pieces of paper, putting them around the, on the walls in a room around me so that I could almost stand inside the story and then move them around to kind of get the structure. And I didn't have to do any of that with these stories. Um, they in terms of. Um, reorganizing the structures of them there was very little that I had to do if anything at all with any of them the one thing that did come out from the um uh from the process as well though is that instead of having to reorganize the structure often certain stories I had to I, 
I found that I had to add something on at the end. So the ghost of Leonard Harriman, for example, I wrote an initial draft of that and then realised that the story is kind of was half complete and it needed a whole second, a whole kind of second section. So the story became kind of twice as big. Um, but other stories, I ended up having to trim out the final closure moments. So a lot, um, particularly in the later stories. Um, so stories like The Living Child, The Mobius Band, um, Present Continuous, definitely, uh, dissolution all have their endings kind of the 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 final closure moments that are that the frame directed me to write in the end i had to cut because it was better for the story and i talk about that in the thesis that it's strange that the um that in some of the stories or a lot particularly in the later stories that i found that it wasn't so much a structural um reorganization of the story that i had to do but that just that that final closure moment that the frame told me to use it, the story didn't need it um, but it was a useful process to go through in terms of drafting um, because it did give me a whole sense of the whole story or the, uh, you know, um, and certainly the elements that I cut from the text, hopefully are th there's enough of a suggestion of those things that the reader carries those with them when they leave the story and go into the post narrational projection of it. Great. Yeah, I, I find it so interesting to, to see how you've kind of uh, approached your research as well you know um creative writing um it, it's got a um uh, you know there's a practical piece involved in it so you've got the sort of re reflective commentary the the research stuff but then you also have the practical element what you're producing that either you know it, it looks at that or em em employs whatever you've used in the in the um the the narrative the descriptive piece um uh, but but it's almost been very scientific, you know, in, in your approach. Something that you wouldn't normally think about in, in the arts. That you've, you know, you you've looked at this, you've identified the theory, um, you've analyzed this in other texts, then you've used that to then, um, uh, in your own writing, and then you had a control group, and then you performed a reverse analysis yeah. as well. It's yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I kind of um, I, an early paper that I delivered, which just had kind of results from my pre-closure analysis. When I um, I delivered that at the in the short story, uh, short story conference, and the, one of the first things when I when I was speaking to people afterwards, the, the people kept saying to me was that they they were really shocked by the fact that I had loads of data in my presentation because I was kind of telling them about how the, the various kind of closure signals that we used and and how often and which ones were predominant and um, so there was lots of ex kind of um, spreadsheets on in my slides and things for for that talk um, and yeah my supervisors um, very early on were kind of saying that this is a, a slightly weird um, creative right thesis because because it's so kind of data driven and and it's got this re this heavy research element at the beginning of it and certainly in terms of my thesis structure it's that's that's kind of being born out in the thesis structure because I'm starting with the the, the research and then the short stories are appear in the middle and then I have the kind of closing commentary where I talk about the 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 impact of the re of the research and the pro and the methodology on my stories um and Usually, with a creative writing thesis, you have your you cre you create the piece of work, and then you write the the kind of the research bit about it. You kind of write the the commentary in ref in primarily in reflection. Whereas mine has a has a lot kind of as you say a lot of kind of um, sort of data driven research at the beginning, which is much more you know um, you know certainly not something that's typical of creative writing uh, PhD. <laughs> We've got a good, um, good question there in the well, a, a long comment question. Is there anybody who wants to ask a question using their mic? Um, by all means, you can. Um, if you'd like to, you can ra use the little raise your hand function, and I'll, I'll call on you. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll, so I'll, I'll read out Amira's. Uh, it says, "Hi Dan, great talk. Uh, it, it's so interesting to hear uh, about the different closure and pre-closure moments, and hear about your process. Do you think there are different pre-closure moments in short stories around the world? And what do you think the differences would be? Not quite a question on the focus of your research, but I'm curious as to what you think. So you looked at American in your your research, and then sort of, uh, and then 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 British as well, and then obviously you had your own writing, but have you thought about anything outside of the Anglosphere perhaps? Yeah, well, I'm definitely interested. I mean, there's definitely something for, I've, I've got an eye on doing something along those lines for sort of postdoc uh, research because 
different cultures definitely have um, different approaches to to storytelling. I mean, both oral storytelling, but also written storytelling. So yeah, definitely. Um, I think particularly, um, you know, the Japanese short story, for example, has a very different kind of structural approach to it. And I'd be really intrigued to look at that as, as one one avenue. But there's lots of um, lots of kind of literary heritages around the world that um, I think would deal with pre-closure differently. I think maybe the Russian short story might well, because of um, you know the influence of Russian formalism and um, structuralism and that kind of thing, would would possibly have quite a lot to show for it as well. So I think there's definitely scope for that. Um, for and so that's a really good question actually. Thank you for that because the um, yeah there's definitely a different approach to ending within short stories around the world. Um, so and I would definitely think, you know, my, my gut kind of tells me that that would be borne out in how they deal with pre-closure as well, because it's all tied up um, within the short story form that they would you know, they would perhaps show different kinds of signalling or so perhaps a, a different operation of pre-closure happening. Maybe it might be all, ha all much more happening at the beginning of a text or at the end of a text rather than spread across the text, as I found in the British short story. So, yeah, I'd be really intrigued to find that out. Interestingly as well, there's, apparently there's a difference, um, and Lohefer found this in her research, um, when she was looking at uh, groups of readers' responses to individual stories, she found that there was a difference between the placement of pre-closure, uh, the, the selection of pre-closure moments that were made by men and women. Um, they seem to respond to the text differently um, and select moments from different parts of the text and certainly I did a small distributed reader study where I um, approached uh, a group of readers with individual texts and I found some um, differences in, in the selection of, of pre-closure of pre -closure sentences, um, but I, not enough. I didn't have a big enough sample size to, to, to be able to say anything definitive about that, but certainly Lohefer definitively states within her American studies that there is a difference between the selections that men make and women make for some reason. She doesn't go into, she didn't do any further research on it, but she did find this difference. Um, and that intrigues me as well as to whether even whether it would be something to do with writers as well, whether um, gender has a um, has an effect on where writers put pre-closure moments perhaps to start with as well. Not that it's all down to the writer because obviously the reader might select a moment that the writer hasn't consciously considered as a pre-closure moment. But um, there's definitely scope I think for that as well that um, uh, looking at how um, gender might impact on presentation of closure within a story. Oh that's fascinating, yeah very fascinating. And it sounds like there's a lot of a lot of things to chase up and, and avenues to explore beyond just uh, in your thesis, which is always great. I mean, that's that's what good research does. Are there any any other questions? Anything anybody would like to ask? Any comments? <laughs> um, I, I, I guess just a, a, a final quick question um, before we close. Um, you chose 1800 to uh, 2015. Um, yeah. Obviously, you have to limit scope, otherwise, you, you know, your thesis will be <laughs> hundreds of thousands of words long. Um, but uh, have you looked at anything earlier than 1800 um, or thought about short stories? Or, or maybe it's just not a genre or, or uh, that's really used in the 18th century? Um, I think you do get you do get the odd outlier. Um, but I think it really starts to take shape and, and even the, the sample stories that I've got from 1800 to 1850, um, you're still kind of seeing the tail end of the, the, the emergence of the form from the kind of the, the sort of sketch and uh, the sh kind of short uh, memoir or anecdote um, piece as well. So you don't tend to see so, um, so many kind of short stories, formal short stories. It's only kind of, I think it's the sort of the influence of Hawthorne and Poe in the States and and the impact that they have that kind of really starts to draw it into being a defined sort of genre. But there's definitely texts that are short stories that from before that date, because I think Philip Henshaw in the um, in his Penguin collection of, of the British short story has identified texts as far back as the, the 1600s. So there's definitely scope for kind of, yeah, for, for sort of looking in that area. But as you say, I kind of 
to kind of make it manageable, um, I had to kind of have some cut-off points. And, and I kind of, as far as possible, I sort of mirrored Lo Hafer's period. So she had three um, because her, her research, um, I think the stories that she looked at went up to about 1985. So because the time had kind of sort of moved on since then, um, I added an extra period on to, to, to take in the contemporary period um, that, we, you know, the, at the time in which it was just around when I was doing the research. So, um, yeah, I try. I sort of followed her framework in uh, as much as anything, so that I could. There were there was a possibility of making comparison with her data on the American story as well. Uh, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. I found that really, really fascinating. Um, really interesting. Um, great answers as well to all the questions. And uh, Amir wrote, uh, "Thanks, Dan. That was a great answer. Couldn't unmute, unfortunately, or turn the camera on. So I'll just look at Pete and frown. But no, I, th I teams can be difficult. I understand. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, that's great. Thanks for all the questions. That they're really, yeah, really interesting. Um, yeah, really interesting questions. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Then. So for that, I guess we just uh, can all give a round of applause. Hopefully everybody can can use the virtual applause. If you go there, at least the perf. There we go. <laughs> See? <laughs> Thank you very much. So so we'll have a recording of this uh, that we can we can share if anybody wants to watch. Um, and have a good day. Thanks very much.